Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in the playlist on angiogenesis. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the vascular endothelial growth factor, which is often abbreviated to VEGF, receptor. So the receptor for the vascular endothelial growth factor. And we're going to look at the downstream pathways of this receptor and how it induces changes uh, within the endothelial cells which it is going to act on. Okay, so the structure then for this video. What we're going to start off with is a basic introduction. So we're going to just remind ourselves of basic concepts concerning angiogenesis, the two different types of uh, angiogenesis. Okay, we're then going to talk about uh, the release of vascular endothelial growth factor from uh, hypoxic cells. And then what we'll talk about is the different types of vascular endothelial growth factors. And then we'll talk about them interacting with receptors on the surface of endothelial cells. And then we'll look at the pathways downstream of the receptor within the endothelial cell. Okay, but the motivation for all of this is angiogenesis. Okay, so basically, let's say we have uh, a capillary here. Let's say this is a capillary like so, and then we'll have a capillary over here as well, so we've just got some tissue, and we've got capillaries within this tissue, and then let's say we just so happen to have a cell here, which is hypoxic, or a bunch of cells which are hypoxic, and this bunch of cells which are hypoxic, and I'll just draw a few more of them here, okay, so here's our bunch of cells, this is what's called an angiogenic centre, Okay, so when uh, cells become hypoxic, what's going to happen is these cells are going to start releasing uh, growth factors, basically called vascular endothelial growth factors, or VEGF, of which the main one, as we'll see, is vascular endothelial growth factor A, but we'll come back to that in a moment. So they're going to start releasing vascular endothelial growth factor. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to act on the endothelial cells of the capillaries here and produce angiogenesis. And there are two different types of angiogenesis that can be induced uh, in capillaries, basically. Okay, and these are known as sprouting angiogenesis and also intersuspective angiogenesis. So this is type 1. Okay, and intersuspective, sorry, intersusceptive angiogenesis, which is also known as uh, splitting angiogenesis. Okay, so inter, into rather susceptive angiogenesis, and this is also called splitting angiogenesis. So I'll give basic outlines or as to what these two are. Okay, so. Sprouting angiogenesis is where um, the capillary sprouts a little stalk, basically, a little bud, if you like. Okay, so it will give off a little bud like this. And of course, this capillary down here will also give off a little bud. And what will happen is these little buds will grow towards the angiogenic center, and then the two buds will meet one another. And the overall result of this is that you're going to create a whole uh, new blood vessel that will connect these two uh, capillaries and it will go right through where the original angiogenic center was, okay? So that will mean that that um, cluster of cells is no longer hypoxic because it's got a new capillary feeding it. Okay, so that's sprouting angiogenesis. So um, this is sprouting, I'll just sort of highlight this one. So this is one, all of this is one over here. Now, uh, into susceptive angiogenesis or splitting angiogenesis, what happens there is you take a capillary like so, and actually, intersusceptive angiogenesis doesn't have to occur in capillaries, it can occur in bigger blood vessels as well. So, you take your blood vessel here, and uh, what's going to happen is effectively you're going to split uh, this blood vessel into two. So, what will happen? is it will do something along the lines of this. So we'll show the middle having split into two separate uh, blood vessels like so. Okay, so as you can see this one portion here is now split into two separate ones and this is why it's called splitting or intersusceptive angiogenesis. Okay, so vascular endothelial growth factor can trigger both of these different types of angiogenesis. Okay, and to do this, it has to 
trigger changes in the endothelial cells. So it's the endothelial cells that this vascular endothelial growth factor is going to act on. Okay, so it's going to bind to receptors on the surface of the endothelial cells and trigger changes in them, which will then uh, provoke the endothelial cells into uh, sprouting and intersusceptive slash splitting angiogenesis. Okay, right. So now let's look at everything in a bit more detail. So we'll start off with the process by which hypoxic cells release vascular endothelial growth factor. We'll then talk about the different types of vascular endothelial growth factor. We'll then talk about the different types of receptor for vascular endothelial growth factor. And we'll then talk about the downstream pathways of the vascular endothelial growth factor receptors. Okay, right. And the whole motivation is that we are looking at how does this molecule trigger changes in the endothelial cells? Okay, and we're going to see that it triggers uh, division changes, but also it's going to trigger huge changes potentially in the phenotype of the cells, basically, and they're going to be needed because you don't just need division of the endothelial cells to get, for instance, the sprouting or the uh, splitting of the blood vessel. You need migration and order basically it's a very ordered event and that's far more complex than just having cells dividing and dividing and dividing if you just had cells dividing and dividing and dividing you'd end up with a mess basically you'd end up with a tumor okay uh, this is very very ordered what we're going to see here Okay, so, uh, and basically it's achieved by changing gene expression within the cell. So we're going to see how uh, the vascular endothelial growth factors change gene expression within the cell. Okay, so we'll start off with how these hypoxic cells release vascular endothelial growth factor. So basically, the um, trigger for the production of vascular endothelial growth factors is something known as hypoxia inducible factor one. Okay, and for short, this is abbreviated to HIF one. So this stands for H is for hypoxia, uh, then the I is for inducible, okay, and then the F is for factor. So this is hypoxia inducible factor, and it's hypoxia inducible factor one. Okay, now hypoxia inducible factor 1 is actually a dimer of two separate proteins. So let me draw these two separate proteins here. It's made up of two uh, subunits, basically. It's a heterodimer and they're different subunits. So one of the subunits of hypoxia inducible factor is known as hypoxia inducible factor 1 and then it's alpha. Okay, and the other is hypoxia inducible factor 1 beta. Okay, so both of them together, like I've drawn here, is the hypoxia inducible factor 1. Now, you don't usually get hypoxia inducible factor 1 heterodimers forming within the cytoplasm of cells. Okay, oh, in fact, you don't get them forming in the cytoplasm of cells ever. You get them forming in the nucleus. Okay, and the reason you don't usually get them forming in... Um, in cells which are at normoxic conditions, so under normal uh, levels of oxygen, and you don't get the formation of these heterodimers, is because there is no hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha. So under normoxic conditions, you usually produce hypoxia inducible factor 1 beta, and it is usually present within the nucleus of the cell. So this is present within the nucleus of the cell. So in the nucleus of the cell, it under normal oxygen conditions, you'll find lots of, lots of hypoxia-inducible factor 1 beta. So let's just show this. So here is the cell. Okay. Here is the nucleus. And in the nucleus, you'll find hypoxia-inducible factor 1 beta. But it won't have its buddy. It won't have hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha. And the reason that you don't have hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha is that the instant the cell makes some hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha protein, it's destroyed. Okay, so it's not that you don't make hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha, it's that the instant you do make it, it's destroyed. And this occurs because hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha has a special region known as the oxygen dependent degradation domain. Okay, so we'll show it here. So I'm just going to colour in the hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha protein so that I don't have to label it anymore. I can just colour label it. 
So here it is, and here it is again in green. Okay, and this special domain that I've shown here, which I'm going to colour in red, uh, this is the oxygen dependent degradation domain. Okay, so this is the oxygen dependent degradation domain. And for short, uh, the oxygen dependent degradation domain is often abbreviated uh, to the ODD domain. Okay, so oxygen dependent degradation is abbreviated to ODD and then it's domain. So this is the ODD domain. Okay, right. Uh, so, in the oxygen dependent degradation domain of hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha, you have two special prolines basically. Okay, so there are two proline residues, and these proline residues can be hydroxylated. So let me show the structure of a proline residue, and then let me explain uh, what it means to be hydroxylated. Okay, so. Uh, here's the amino terminus of the proline residue, and I'm going to show it as though it's a residue. So I'm not going to show it. Um, I'm not going to show it as the pure amino acid. I'm going to show it as though it's bound within a protein. So here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the carboxylic acid group, and both the amino group and the carboxylic acid group will be as though they're linked to uh, neighbouring amino acids, basically. So these are the links, uh, the peptide links to the neighbouring amino acids. Okay, and then what you have is a uh, five-membered ring structure here. So the R group of proline is quite unusual because it involves the amino group, basically. And this is why the amino group, when it's bound to um, another amino acid along in a polypeptide has no hydrogen atoms coming off it. Okay, so we have this free carbon structure sitting off the side which makes a five-membered ring here. And all of these carbons have two nitrogens coming off. So this is the structure of a normal proline residue. Now you have two important proline residues within this oxygen-dependent uh, degradation domain. Okay, and those are proline 402 and also proline 600, sorry, 564. Okay, so 564. So proline 402 and proline 564 uh, are both going to uh, be hydroxylated. Okay, and this hydroxylation is oxygen dependent. It will only occur when oxygen is present. And what's going to happen is you're going to take off one of these hydrogens off this carbon here, okay, which is the fourth carbon of the proline, because if we count the carboxylic acid carbon as the first one, then we continue counting along second, third, and here is the fourth one. So basically, we're going to take a hydrogen off this fourth carbon and stick on an alcohol group instead, and that will give us four hydroxy proline, okay? So basically, you're going to convert these two proline residues at position 402 and 564 into four hydroxy proline residues rather than proline. Uh, and there are three enzymes which are capable of doing this, and these are known as prolyl hydroxylase uh, domain enzymes. Okay, so these are called prolyl hydroxylase. Uh, domain enzymes, and for short, prolyl hydroxylase domain is short, uh, well, is shortened to PHD. So these are the PHD enzymes. Okay, right. And there are three members of this family of PHD enzymes. Uh, there is the PHD enzyme one, uh, called PHD one. There is the PHD enzyme two, called PHD two, and then there is the PHD enzyme. Uh, called PHD3. And all of these enzymes catalyze this reaction where proline is converted to 4-hydroxyproline, and it's specifically these proteins at position 402 and 564, okay? So under normal oxygen conditions, the instant the hypoxia, uh, sorry, the hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha uh, is made, what is going to happen is these PHD enzymes are going to uh, hydroxylate the proline at position 402 and the proline at position 564. And let me stress again, this is the oxygen-dependent 
reaction. This will only occur if oxygen is present. So if oxygen isn't present, if the cell is in hypoxic conditions, then uh, you won't get this hydroxylation and therefore you won't destroy the protein. So it's this hydroxylation that is going to lead to the destruction of the uh, hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha. Okay, uh, so um, basically once you have hydroxylated these proteins on the hypoxia inducible factor, let me draw it over here, so here's our hypoxia inducible factor, and now we have hydroxylated these proteins, so they have been modified so that they are hydroxylated. Okay, what's going to happen is a special protein is going to come and bind here, okay, and this is the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor protein. So I'll colour this in a special colour. Uh, we'll have this in blue. Okay, so it's come and bound to these hydroxylated proline residues at position 402 and 564 of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha protein. Okay, and this protein has a great big name. It's known as the von Hippel-Lindau. Um, so Hippel and Lindau have a... Um, dash between them, von Hippel-Lindau, and then it's the tumor suppressor protein, okay, and it's the um, protein which has, uh, well, which dysfunctions in von Hippel-Lindau disease, uh, which is a hereditary condition which causes uh, horrible forms of cancer, okay, and um, it's through the study of that disease that we found the protein, and for short, uh, this is abbreviated to little p and then VHL. So little p in front of anything implies that this is a tumor suppressor protein. And then von Hippel-Lindau VHL. So von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor protein. Okay, right. Uh, so once the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor protein is bound to these hydroxylated proline residues on the oxygen-dependent degradation domain of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha, what's going to happen is this will lead to the ubiquitination of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha. So it will get ubiquitin groups added onto it. So here I've drawn one ubiquitin group, but in reality it will get many ubiquitin groups added onto it. So I'll colour this in in pink. Right, and proteins which get ubiquitinated, which is the process of having ubiquitin groups added onto them, uh, get targeted for proteasomal destruction, so they get destroyed by the proteasome. So let me just draw a picture of the proteasome down here. So the proteasome is quite a terrifying thing in the world of proteins. It is a tube, and proteins go in one side, and uh, fragments of proteins come out the other. So basically what will happen is this ubiquitin group that is added onto the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha will bind to the entrance of the uh, proteasome, and then what will happen is the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha uh, will get dragged into the tube of the proteasome and it will get cut up into loads and loads of little fragments and the little fragments will come out the other side basically okay so it's basically going to destroy the hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha it's going to chop it up into loads of little bits Okay, so this is what happens in normal oxygen conditions. You make the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha, you hydroxylate the proline residues, and that's the bit that is dependent on oxygen's presence. Okay, then the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor protein combined to these hydroxylated proline residues, it then leads to the ubiquitination of the uh, hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha protein, which then is targeted for destruction via the proteasome. Okay, so usually you don't have any hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha surviving this. Okay, uh, now when the cell suddenly becomes hypoxic, when it has low oxygen levels, you can no longer hydroxylate the proline residues in the oxygen-dependent degradation domain of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. Okay, so they stay as normal proline residues. This means that von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor protein cannot bind to them, and therefore the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha is spared ubiquitination, so it doesn't get ubiquitinated anymore. Okay, so it doesn't get fed through the proteasome and it doesn't get destroyed. So the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha remains within the cell and then will go into the nucleus 
where it will meet the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 beta, and they will finally form the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 complex here, which is this heterodimer. Now, what does the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 do? Well, basically, it's a transcription factor in the nucleus. So let me just explain uh, the concept of a transcription factor, because we're going to need this big time in this video. Okay, so... Um, Upstream of all eukaryotic genes, you have a special uh, region of the DNA known as the promoter region. So if this is the DNA, let me draw a gene here. So let's let this be the gene here. Okay, and I'll highlight this in red, I think. So in red, here is the gene. Now upstream of the gene, you have a special portion of the DNA that is not involved in protein synthesis. Well, it, when I say it's not involved in protein synthesis, what I mean is it's not actually going to be translated itself into protein. So it won't be read by the ribosome and uh, turned into a sequence of amino acids. Okay, but it is going to control uh, how much of the uh, protein for this downstream gene that you're actually going to produce. So I'll highlight the promoter region in blue here. Okay, so this is the promoter region of this gene. And I don't want to put that there, okay, so I'll make it like this. Right, so this is the promoter region here. Now, how does the promoter region control how much of the downstream gene you actually make? Well, in order to actually make the gene, what you need to happen is you need an enzyme known as RNA polymerase 2 uh, to come and read the gene, uh, produce a piece of mRNA polymerase, sorry about that, polymerase, Okay, uh, you need RNA polymerase 2 to come read the gene, produce a piece of mRNA which is complementary to the coding strand of the gene. Okay, send this piece of mRNA into the cytoplasm where it can be read by a ribosome and translated into a protein. Okay, uh, now where does the RNA polymerase 2 actually get access to the gene? How does it open the gene up? Where does it bind and begin the process? What well, binds to the promoter region? So RNA polymerase 2 comes, binds to the promoter region, opens the DNA up, starts making the mRNA uh, transcript, and that's how transcription occurs, basically, or how it's initiated, at least. Right, so... If the promoter region has a very high affinity for binding to RNA polymerase 2, then bingo. The RNA polymerase 2 will bind there all the time. You'll get mRNA being produced all the time. You'll produce, therefore, a huge amount of protein, because if you've got a huge amount of mRNA, it follows that you'll produce more protein. Okay, so more translation, more protein. So, uh, high affinity promoter region, large expression of the gene. Whereas if you have a low affinity promoter region, if the promoter region doesn't really like binding to RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will hardly ever bind there. You'll get hardly any mRNA being produced, okay, and therefore you'll get hardly any protein produced. Now, a transcription factor is a protein which binds to the promoter regions of genes. So here it is. This is our transcription factor in orange here. So it will come in and bind to promoter regions, and it will alter the affinity of the promoter region for binding to RNA polymerase 2. Okay, uh, so transcription factors bind to many different promoter regions. There are a huge number of different genes in the human genome. I think it's over 20,000. Okay, uh, so any transcription factor will have a whole plethora of promoter regions that it binds to. Uh, so maybe it will have a hundred promoter regions which it binds to, okay? And at some of them, it will increase the affinity of that promoter region for binding to RNA polymerase 2. So some of those 100 that it binds to will have their affinity, their affinity rather, for RNA polymerase 2 increased by the binding of the transcription factor. Therefore, uh, the um, RNA polymerase 2 will bind more often with the transcription factor bound, and therefore you'll get more mRNA produced and therefore more protein produced. Therefore, the transcription factor has enhanced the expression of the gene downstream of those promoter regions. At other promoter regions, that same transcription factor will decrease the affinity of 
RNA polymerase binding to that promoter region and therefore you'll get less mRNA produced and therefore you'll produce less protein and therefore you have repressed the expression of the protein. Okay, so one transcription factor will enhance gene expression at some genes and decrease uh, gene expression at other genes. Okay, so that is what is going to happen with these hypoxia inducible factor ones. They are going to bind to a whole plethora of promoter regions and they're going to enhance the expression of some genes and repress the expression of other genes. Okay, now one of the genes, or at least some of the genes, because as we'll see there are many different vascular endothelial growth factors, but one of the genes that's going to get its expression enhanced is the gene for vascular endothelial growth factor uh, A. Okay, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video we'll talk about the different types of vascular endothelial growth factor, and vascular endothelial growth factor A is going to be the most important for our purposes. Uh, and then we'll talk about the different isoforms of vascular endothelial growth factor A, because although there is only one gene for vascular endothelial growth factor A, or two genes if you're talking about the homologous chromosomes, um, there are different splice variants, and this gives rise to different isoforms of vascular endothelial growth factor A. And we'll then talk about uh, B receptors for uh, vascular endothelial growth factor.